Uh, hello, um, today is the 22nd of March, 2023, and uh, we'll talk about uh, the very important uh, Japanese architect, one of the most important, uh, Kenzo Tange. Uh, let's read a little bit about him. Kenzo Tange was born in September 1913, but died on the 22nd of March, 2005, so just eight years ago exactly on this day, was a Japanese architect and winner of the 1987 Pritzker Prize for Architecture. He was one of the most significant architects of the 20th century, combining traditional Japanese styles with modernism and designed major buildings on five continents. His career spanned the, the entire second half of the 20th century, producing numerous distinctive buildings in Tokyo, other Japanese cities and cities around the world, as well as ambitious physical plans for Tokyo and its um, environs. Tange was also an influential patron of the metabolism movement. He said it was, I believe, around 1959 or at the beginning of the 60s that I began to think about what I was later to call structuralism, a reference to the architectural movement known as Dutch structuralism. Influenced for, from an early age by the Swiss modernist Le Corbusier, Tange gained international recognition in 1949 when he won the competition for the design of Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. He was a member of the of SIAM, Congrès International, International d'Architecture Moderne, uh, in the 1950s, he did not join the group of young Siam architects known as uh, Team 10, though his 1960 Tokyo Bay plan was influential for Team 10 in the 1960s, as well as the group that became known as Metabolis, Metabolism. His university studies on urbanism put him in an ideal position to handle redevelopment projects after the Second World War. His ideas were explored in designs for Tokyo and Skopje. Tange's work influenced a generation of architects across the world. This was the man. He lived a long life, died in the 90 something, 97 or so. And uh, he, indeed a very important architect for Japan and the world here. He is with his camera near a building by the Corbusier in Ahmedabad in India. Uh, here he is again. Here he is contemplating uh, one of his buildings. From what I understood, he lived for a while in China uh, when he was a kid uh, with his parents. And then they, I don't know what they were doing in China, but uh, they, uh, they returned to, to Japan. But he was, he was Japanese. Here he is uh, with, um, uh, you know, uh, Japanese uh, metabolis. He's in the middle. I love this period in Japanese architecture. You know, these young people who wanted to, you know, escape the, the dark shadows, the severe shadows of the Second World War and, and reconstruct Japan with sacrifice, with very hard work and inspiration and courage. They, 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 they made uh, very courageous proposals. They were visionaries, actually. The architect as a hero. Architects today tend to depreciate themselves, to regard themselves as no more than just ordinary citizens without the power to reform the future. Well, I would say he's correct. And uh, I think uh, we need people like him to remind us that uh, without arrogance, the architect could be a catalyst for, for change. The architect could be an agent of transformation, the transformation of society and of life itself. There is a powerful need for symbolism 
And that means the architecture must have something that appeals to the human heart. Human heart, not human brain. There is a powerful need for symbolism, and that means, I don't know, it appeal, it's written twice, and that means the architecture must have something that appeals to the human heart. Indeed, inconsistency itself breeds vitality. Wisdom. Yes, inconsistency. That is even a contradiction. No? In 1953, Tange and the architectural journalist and critic Noboru Kawazoe were invited to attend the reconstruction of the Ise Shrine. The shrine has been reconstructed over 20 years, and in 1953, it was the 59th iteration. Normally, the reconstruction process was a very close affair. But this time, the ceremony was open to architects and journalists to document the event. The ceremony coincided with the end of the American occupation, and it seemed to symbolize a new start in Japanese architecture. In 1965, when Tange and Kabazoe published the book Ise, Prototype of Japanese Architecture, and is a magnificent book, and I'm lucky to have it, he likened the building to a modernist structure, an honest expression of materials, a functional design, and prefabricated elements. I mentioned the Ise Shrine uh, the other day because it is an, in an interesting way in which Japan uh, keeps... Uh, uh, the, 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 the very meaningful Ise Shrine continuously young and alive. There are two sites, one near the other. On one side exists a built shrine, and every, uh, here I see 20 years, but uh, anyway, uh, let's say every 20 years, they built on the adjacent site, which is empty, exactly what is on the first site. And then they destroy what is on that side. And 20 years later, they do the same. So there is this alternation in, um, uh, I don't know, 11, 11th centuries or so, uh, more than 1,000 years, the Ise Shrine was continuously rebuilt, built, re destroyed, rebuilt, built, destroyed, rebuilt. And Today it looks like it, it looked like uh, 11 centuries ago. And it is a formidable architecture, although formidably modest. And here we see what I try to explain, the two adjacent sites. And this, this, this is the new iteration, is, is exactly what is here, but rebuilt. And then this this land is freed, it's, the, the buildings are destroyed, and then 20 years later, they rebuild what is here on the other side, and then they destroy what's here. So in this way, <clears throat> there is the Ise Shrine continuously in good shape, continuously young, so to speak. But it's a very important shrine in the Shinto tradition, and it's dedicated to Amaterasu, the formidable the magnificent um, sun goddess, because in Japan, the god associated with the sun is a goddess, a woman, Amaterasu. And here it is. the great Ise Shrine in Japan, <clears throat> building and context. Now, Kenzo Tange, 1951-1953, his own house in Tokyo, is still inspired by tradition, but, but with a certain modernism.
although he was skeptical, he did declare that uh, tradition um, has its limits. If you try to belong to your time, uh, you cannot rely. Uh, he put it in a, in, a, in a clearer way than I do. But he seemed to be skeptical that uh, dwelling uh, on the past uh, was the way moving towards the future. And he, he said that actually tradition um, be, becomes, became, although this is contradicted by this very building he built, but this is one of his earliest buildings, if not the earliest, uh, the tradition is, um, is, is not easily any longer a source for, uh, uh, for creativity. Something was broken, perhaps, you know, in the in the course of modernity speeding up. But this is contradict, contradicted again by this very project, his own house, from that time. Quite a large piece of land now. I mean, in Tokyo or near Tokyo, obviously Kenzo Tangye was doing well for himself. I don't know exactly why I put this picture here with a cemetery and uh, This is uh, the Hiroshima memorial that he built, but I, I'm still, I don't remember why I included these two pictures here. The Hiroshima Peace Center, A, a city born from ashes and from great suffering, but rebuilt. Splendid, splendidly so. Here it is one of the few remaining structures after the deadly um, atomic bomb uh, dropping uh, on, on Hiroshima, this building here. And uh, I'm sure the site of the peace memorial was chosen, you see it's in the axis of this uh, ruined building, as a reminder of, of, of something which uh, Vladimir Putin uh, ref refuses to remind himself of. It's literally a triumph of life over death. Now an art center, 1955-1957. You know, the, these years, 1950s, 1960s in Japan had uh, this heroic stance, which I, I admire very much. Unfortunately, they did use a lot of concrete, it's true, 
we live in a different time when, uh, because of uh, the climate change, uh, uh, we should be very careful about um, uh, relying on concrete. But at that time, concrete was a material which expressed solidity, triumph of uh, you know the shadows of the past, the shadows of of of, of the war, uh, you know a, a rebirth. A country's rebirth, and I read that actually Japan uh, had and still has, um, you know, uh, considering the size of the country and the, you know, the population, the number of the, you know, the of the population, uh, very large. Uh, usage perhaps the largest in the in the world of concrete many many buildings were erected and and there are many so-called brutalist buildings built with, con with concrete in japan in a imabari city hall complex kenzo tange 1958 talking about concrete concrete it is Kagawa Prefectural Government Office in, uh, office in Japan, Kagawa, 1958. In very few years, Japan truly, uh, you know, with I'm sure with immense sacrifices, they rebuilt the country, and and Japan became a a powerful economic uh, uh, wonder country. They are very hardworking, the Japanese, and the, but they are also open. They they study very carefully what is happening in other countries. Uh, they don't ignore what is happening uh, outside of Japan, and then uh, they filter through their own sensibility and their own roots, rooting in the in their uh, you know significant past, and the result is uh, is what we see. Uh, as I read at the beginning, uh, you know, there is a certain structuralism in his architecture, but not always. Here is more apparent. Kenzo Tange. But I admire most, mostly, uh, or most, um, that this uh, heroic stance, this uh, vigorous, you know, uh, vital, uh, situating oneself in life, you know, a uh, dedication, a heroic dedication to creativity, to, to saying yes to life, to asserting what they believed in. And I, I don't see today too many examples of, of such a heroic, uh, you know, position in, 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 in architecture and in life itself. And I think we need it. This is a very, very uh, intriguing uh, city hall, Kurashiki City Hall, 1960. Uh, here is the plan. Uh, and uh, let's see. Again, you know, a uh, massive uh, concrete building, which they needed, I think, this, this kind of architecture to, to fight off the you know the tragic remnants of the second world war and the two bombings on hiroshima and nagasaki uh, this was a country that was decimated of course they had their own role in you know uh, in, in, in the dynamics of the of the war but they lost the war they were decimated and they came back to 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 asserting themselves uh, but very, uh, uh, very impressively. Yeah. 
you look at those foundations, you know, of the building, and uh, you know, we are dealing here with a country that uh, is confronted with very strong earthquakes. But the solidity of the building and the, you know, the the belief in such buildings uh, seems to discourage maybe sometimes even even nature. Could we understand how many sacrifices were made in order to arrive here to, you know, Japan to, to assert itself architecturally in this way? Personally, I like more uh, raw concrete than the polished concrete of uh, Tadawando. Because I think this one is in a way more honest, you know, that polishing of the concrete that uh, I think Tadawando even um, uh, patented uh, is a little bit problematic because in essence, concrete is concrete. It's still a cold material. When you polish it in order to give the illusion that it is less raw than it is, but in its essence, it is a it is a raw material. It is a conglomerate, as Frank Lloyd Wright uh, uh, called it. Housing, 1961, uh, 1961, row, row houses, uh, let's see, uh, rather European, so to speak, in the configuration. But we see here the, the, the same uh, concern for a dynamic architecture where diagonals are employed. Uh, you see the houses are not parallel with the street but at an angle, kind of like in uh, housing uh, projects done by Arne Jakobsen in Denmark. Okay, now the Nichinan Cultural Center, 1963. I like the plan of this one and I see some, uh, now that I think of it, uh, there is a building in Washington by IMP, which if I look at the plan, I seem to see some uh, similarities between what IMP did later and what uh, Kenzo Tange did in 1963. Architects sometimes inspire themselves from uh, other works, from other people, and they don't acknowledge it. Even some of the more important architects do this. This is one of the, my preferred buildings from the, uh, from the works of um, Kenzo Tange. It's very, you know, it's, it's, it's very sculptural, it's very vigorous. One would say it's too vigorous. It's uh, like a fortress, like a fortress, but uh, I think it has virtues, expressive virtues. So it's a, it's a city hall, no, no, a cultural center, but it's, it's like a bulwark of resistance. Maybe that's what he wanted to express, you know, the resistance of culture vis-a-vis -vis consumerism and, you know, pragmatism or not pragmatism, mercantilism. It's like he wanted culture to defend itself against the assault of, uh, you know, materialistic concerns. And I like the patina of the concrete. 
But I would understand if not everybody would like it. But it is again a heroic, a heroic architecture. Very much so. It's a fortress. This is what this person wrote. Kenzo Tange's buildings will make you believe in a better future. Yes, the, the vitality, the vigor um, of, of his buildings uh, do have this, uh, uh, this uh, attribute. affected by the elements, you know, uh, all these so-called imperfections, they actually add to the, to the you know, the, the artistic impact of the, of the wall, of, the, of the, the exterior of the building. They don't subtract the so-called uh, imperfections or dirt or whatever. They actually amplify the, the emotional uh, force uh, of the building, I would say. This is not a building that is trying to soothe you. You know, it's not uh, covered in plaster. It's not, uh, it's not uh, trying to comfort you uh, by misleading sweetness. No, it's not caressing you. This is not a caressing building. This is a building that tells you culture is a struggle uh, it's the fight for spirit, for creativity, it requires effort, it requires sacrifice, it requires a heroic uh, stance, and, and the building, I think, ex it expresses this. We Japanese architects in our endeavors to resolve the problems facing modern Japan, that's what he wrote, have devoted a great deal of attention to the Japanese tradition and have in the end arrived at the point which I have sought to elucidate for you. If, however, there can be detected a trace of tradition in my works or in those of my generation, then our creative powers have not been at their best then we are still in the throes of evolving our creativity. I want by all means my buildings to be free of the label traditional. Well, because he wanted the new. He wanted to be true to his time and place. 
and he didn't want the comfort of uh, easily borrowed uh, forms from tradition. Although we saw his first house had, uh, you know, a rather explicit connection with what we call tradition or, or Japanese tradition. But I understand his, his uh, desire to enhance you know, the need for the new and not to, you know, find, uh, you know, uh, comfort in a easy, uh, you know, uh, connecting uh, connection with uh, what we call the past. Now, the Olympic Arena at Tokyo, and I would, I would oppose what he did in 1961-1964 to what was done just uh, the, the other year, I mean, in 2021 in Tokyo. And I'm referring particularly to the to the with the Olympic Stadium built by Ken Gokuma. So it was uh, 80 years no, 60 years later that Ken Gokuma appropriating, uh, you know, in a way the 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 winning entry of Zaha Hadid. She won the competition for the Olympic Stadium in Tokyo. But for some strange reasons, the Japanese decided to grant the commission to Kengo Kuma, not to the winner of the competition, meaning Zaha Hadid. But I think if we compare the Olympic arena that Kenzo Tange built in between 1961 and to 1964 with what Kengo Kuma built, I think we see a difference, a significant difference, the same country, the same people, Japanese architects, but building very differently. What Ken, what um, uh, Ken Zotange did was was magnificent. Then look a very fresh, very simple in a way, very clear uh, architecture of confidence, but uh, organic, uh, uh, you know, uh, fluid, um, uh, truly uh, uh, an architecture that showed. Um, uh, uh, genuine, uh, genuine um, uh, vitality, and uh, uh, the aesthetics are uh, as 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 convincing today as they were 60 years ago. I mean, look again. There is much more creativity. There is a vision here that these days we might not have. I mean, again, if you compare the stadium built by Kengo Kuma with these arenas built by, by uh, Kenzo Tange, we see a great difference. I mean, this, there are two arenas, but they, 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 these works are uh, astonishing. You know, they continue to, to, to inspire. Unfortunately, Kenzo Tange himself changed, and we are going to see towards the end of the presentation some newer buildings by him which do not have the same vision, the same force, the same uh, assertiveness these earlier buildings had. Maybe it's the fatality of the human condition. You know, we grow older and we become less, um, less intense, less clear. Um, you know, maybe even, uh, uh, you know, affected by, um, you know, uh, too much success and we could become, um, uh, you know, uh, grandiose or megalomaniacal, but, but here it's an architecture of uh, splendid balance and uh, it, there is assertiveness, there is, uh, um, you know, uh, courage, but there is also a sense, still a sense of uh, equilibrium, I would say. It's, it's not an arrogant architecture. Well, we are going to see at the end of the presentation some examples which are less 
convincing exactly because of it. Now I don't know why. Ah, yes, this I took from uh, from uh, the website. I don't know who is that person crying there, but this was the stadium proposed by Zaha Hadid, and she did win the competition, but it was not built. It was built, the stadium uh, conceived by uh, Ken Gokuma, and apparently Zaha Hadid uh, thought, and her office uh, thought, thought that um, Ken Gokuma inspired himself from, from their project, and they even sued him in court. This is the power of architecture, an architecture that um, doesn't try to hide itself in a, a fake uh, modesty. It's a, it's a building that, uh, that uh, asserts, I think, the human condition uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with honesty and, uh, and uh, without uh, mimicking, uh, you know, uh, as I said, a, a modesty which is not there. I don't know if I described well what I feel when I look at this building. They are structurally sound, they are organic, they are modern, they are even Japanese, and they, they, they promote the spirit of the Olympics. Uh, the, uh, it, it's, it, it has that the spirit of, uh, of, uh, of challenge, because this is what the Olympics mean. You know, the, those sport teams, they challenge themselves. They want to achieve excellence. And, uh, and the building, I think the buildings, the two buildings uh, uh, do this in a very inspired and inspiring way. We could call them the temples of sport. They could have been uh, churches or cathedrals or temples, but they are the temples of sport. Now, a small Olympic, I already saw it. Um, it's one of the two buildings, the smaller one. Now we arrive at a Christian building, a cathedral, St. Mary's Cathedral. And uh, we receive a lesson in architecture and even faith from a country which is not, uh, you know, a Christian country. A cathedral for St. Mary in Tokyo, 1963. So built 60 years ago, uh, you know, a spirit shouldn't have uh, frontiers. And I think uh, what he did here teaches us that, uh, you know, a Japanese, a good Japanese architect who was not a Christian could build a very convincing cathedral. Uh, the artistic form of this object, he calls it an object, um, or I don't know if it was him who wrote this text, on the other hand, has the twofold quality of, of both mirroring and enriching reality. This understanding of reality, which takes place through architectural creation, requires that the anatomy of reality, its substantial and spiritual structure, be grasped, grasped as a whole. Uh, the, from above, the, the building does have the 
the cross very emphatically underlined, but uh, it's, 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 uh, the cross is actually a cross of light in the roof. It's another heroic building by Kenzo Tange. Uh, here is a cross section. And uh, the interior, as I said, is nothing less. I actually like more the interior than the exterior, particularly because of, of the finishes used of the materiality. The, the inside is, is raw, it's raw, even rough. But the outside for, for my taste is too slick. Maybe, maybe I don't know, the uh, administration of the, uh, I mean, the church decided or, or that was his decision. I, I prefer the interior and uh, you see here a glimpse and we are going to see other images. I don't know why it was not left like this to outside, towards outside as well. Maybe because they didn't want to scare people away. I don't know, but the interior is magnificent. It's, 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 you know, again, it's not a building that tries to comfort you through uh, sweet, uh, you know, uh, seductiveness of words. It's, it's, or, 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 or um, images. It has to be raw. Because, uh, you know, uh, the quest for spirit is raw, is, is difficult. And uh, we, we, if we talk of St. Mary, you know, and we talk of Hassan, you know, of Jesus, well, how was the life of Jesus? Was, uh, you know, uh, made uh, sweet and, uh, you know, covered in, plast in plaster and made, uh, do you know, with domestic surgeries and with... Uh, you know, uh, ornamental, uh, uh, you know, gingerbread uh, uh, the decorations. No, it, it was uh, it was a struggle, a struggle for life, but confronting death. And 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 the building inside is uh, uh, through its materiality does have this power. Uh, unfortunately, it was the outside, in my opinion, and I don't know, I don't know why the spirit of the interior. In terms of space, it is expressed properly, but in terms of materiality, maybe it was covered later on. I would have liked the exterior to have the, the exposed concrete, just like in the interior, but it doesn't. I don't know if it was Kenzo Tange's decision or you know the decision of the those who commissioned him. And in the interior, they didn't try to embellish the building. But towards the outside, you can see, you see, it's too clean, it's too shining, it's too smooth. I mean, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's a different spirit. This should have been raw and rough, if, just like the interior. The shapes are correct, are like expressing the interior. But the, the finishes of the outside uh, are a little bit, uh, a little bit pleasing, I would say. The cathedral of 15,000 square meters and the capacity of 600 seats was built between 1963 and 1964. So 60 years ago, um, I don't know who wrote this. One of the things that struck me uh, from the church, especially when compared with other Catholic cathedrals in Europe, Latin America, or Asia itself, was was it secluded? Was its secluded character? That is, there is not a square or a public open space preceding the cathedral, as it is common in the Western tradition. On the contrary, the church is located next to a highway, hidden behind other buildings, and one can only have an idea of its size and magnificent proportions when viewed from a nearby ped pedestrian bridge. Uh, this is during the construction. And again, the interior is moving also, not just because of the space, but because of the texture of the, the exposed concrete. This is one of the most aware, inspiring things I've seen in a minute. I'm not a, I've seen in a minute. <laughs> I'm not an overly uh, religious, but I can see finding God being relatively easy in a place like this. I don't know who wrote this, 
but uh, the translation is not too, too good or the, the English of that person is not too good, but the building is good. Although, as I said, I would have expected the exterior to express the drama of the interior better. Now we see uh, this gymnasium, which was, um, in my team, when I'm not sure what happened to it. Indeed, uh, it, it was destined for demolition. Another heroic building by Kenzo Tange. And uh, there was some news about it, but I forgot. Either the, the architectural community uh, succeeded in defending it or not. But it was very seriously considered for uh, demolition. And it's another very heroic building. Uh, you might even say perhaps too much, too heroic. But this was the spirit, the disposition, the mental and and the, the mental disposition and the emotional disposition of uh, Kenzo Tange towards the heroic architecture. It's about sport again. It's about uh, you know the challenges that uh, practicing sport at a high level uh, require. Now, if this is a Dutch structuralism, I don't think so. And I'm not even sure it can be called structuralism, but it is a, 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 an honest, uh, you know, vigorous expression of how the building was built and how it stands. Now, it is true that the building stands out in a rather provocative way. If you look at the surroundings, what does this building have to do with everything around? It's, it's a unique building that um, you know, uh, neglects uh, an attempt to negotiate between itself and the surroundings. In a way, I would understand why perhaps some people might hate it, because it's... <laughs> It's in, in a way, it's inhuman. I mean, you look at the buildings left and right, and then you look at this monumental gymnasium and you say, wow, what, what's going on here? Again, it's the heroic stance that, uh, you know, is maybe not very common. In sport, is common and should be common because it's, it's giving uh, yourself completely to, you know, to the contest and challenging your, your own limits. Yamanashi Press and Broadcasting Center from 1967, another great heroic structure. Yamanashi Press and Broadcasting Center, 1967. Here it is, the fortress of uh, media. Uh, he built a later one, uh, we are going to see later, but I think these, these earlier works by him until 1970s or 80s are he be his best works.
no one can deny the, 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 the vigor of this building and, and other buildings that we saw by him. And look at the mountains and look at the building. And then look at the houses at the bottom. You know, it's this, this is a public building that expresses the confidence of, uh, of this institution, the media, the press, the news. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a bulwark of resistance in a way. It's, it's, maybe it's optimism is a little bit unwarranted, maybe. I don't know, but it is an impressive building, especially seen from uh, in these black and white pictures from around that time. Kenzo Tangia. Uh, you look at the plants and the section, uh, yeah, drawings, you know, uh, diagrams, uh, bi-dimensional. But uh, the building is actually uh, almost competing with the, with the majestic uh, mountains behind. Yamanashi Broadcasting Center. Uh, today we are overwhelmed by news, news, news. Too, ma too much, too much of them. But, uh, you know, in the right hands, broadcasting is, uh, could be a useful activity when uh, fake news are discouraged, not promoted. It's a citadel, the citadel of uh, broadcasting. Kenzo Tange. Now, I intentionally placed this much later work, you know, more than 20 years later, uh, the Fuji Broadcasting Center, the same function, broadcasting, but we see the difference in the architectural tone or expression. Here it is. To me, this is a disappointing building. It's okay. He had the freedom to design whatever he wanted, but I cannot compare this building with this building. Here you can see that, in my opinion, his creative powers were declining. Uh, yeah, he plays that sphere there, but it's it's unconvincing. It's artificial almost. It's it doesn't have the force of this building. Well, when was this built? Nineteen sixty-seven, I think. Yeah, nineteen sixty-seven. So in thirty in twenty-three years, he changed. From here to here, it's a loss. I, 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 I'm really sorry. Maybe he should have had the, or could have had the wisdom of Konstantin Brunkush who stopped working at 60. But um, he didn't. I mean, there are still, uh, by, you also wonder, was it designed really by himself because he had a very large office. We are going to see also a huge, the city hall of Tokyo, a huge building, very, very large, I mean, tall, but in my opinion, his best work was done in the 60s and 70s. And it's already, I mean, yes, it's not a, a building with mistakes. It's still, a, you know, a, to an extent, a decent building, but a, a decent building is not great architecture. Another press and broadcasting center, Shizuoka in Tokyo. Uh, this one is impressive, and I don't know when it was built. Uh, I don't know how many broadcasting centers they had and have. Uh, 
uh, in Tokyo and in Japan, but this one is also heroic. It's a smaller building, uh, as you can see, but, uh, you know, just contemplating the fact that Japan has earthquakes, here you see the people of Japan uh, uh, saying, je m'en fous, you know, they, they, they don't seem to be uh, scared of earthquakes, if you consider how they build. Again, this is a typical Kenzo Tange building, assertive, optimistic, yeah, self-confident. Obviously, the architectural expression had the upper hand in, uh, in the dialogue between the architect and the engineer. The engineer had to, you know, conform to the desires of the architect and not vice versa. These Japanese, they can build anything, really. It seems they can build anything. And they, they, they achieve perfection in the way they build things. I mean, these uh, structural elements, you look at the profile of the, the steel profile of the columns, they are huge. You see the, the size of a door. This is, you know, solid, massive steel, an eye profile that is one meter uh, or close to 80 centimeters uh, wide going all the way. That's why we can afford this sort of, uh, you know, can deliver the parts of the building coming out of the core. It's very massive, very strong. Lots of steel there. Tokyo City Hall, 
uh, different scans of Tangye. I already mentioned this um, very large building that he built. And unfortunately, he was affected by postmodernism. I uh, I'm not impressed by this architecture. Yes, it's uh, probably functioning very well. Yes, it's huge, but it only proclaims essentially the, the unavoidability of uh, high bureaucracy. And uh, maybe Tange always had a certain um, liking for uh, assertiveness, let's put it in this way. And uh, towards the end of his life, I think, well, he, he was around, uh, I don't know, 70 when he designed this, or his office designed this. I think, I think his office is still functioning today. Yes, it's the city hall of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Tokyo, but uh, why does it have to be so grandiose? If you compare with his earliest work, meaning his house, and you arrive here, it's a distance. Of course, this is a public building and not a private house, but um, I don't know, something happened, I think, to Kenzo Tange. Maybe too much success. Uh, maybe now I say something uh, sacrilegious, uh, you know, maybe he lived for too long. I, I don't know. Too much success could, could uh, change someone, indeed. But from this house to what we just saw, I think is a, is a big distance. Now, as an urbanism, uh, urbanist, and we are approaching the end of the presentation, he did many studies, uh, visionary studies. He was involved with metabolism. Uh, and uh, these people uh, had no problem to envision a Japan on water extending on water uh, and uh, with, uh, you know, uh, very futuristic uh, uh, architectures. I don't know if anybody commissioned them for these studies. It was their attempt, and I say there, because it wasn't just uh, Kenzo Tange. There were other important uh, Japanese uh, metabolist architects, like Yonori Kikutake or Kisho Kurokawa. Even uh, Isozaki, Arata Isozaki made proposals for, uh, you know, uh, the so-called visionary urbanism. But this is what um, Kenzo Tange did. And uh, it only shows that indeed the architect is supposed to try to be an agent of transformation of life and society or society and life. A role many architects unfortunately forget. But the, the heroic stance that Kenzo Tange assumed seems to be diminished now, and in part with good reasons, because we are confronted with the climate change. We, we don't believe any longer in the power of the human being to do only good things. We are more skeptical, more pessimistic. The climate, uh, the warming is a reality, the global warming, the melting of the icebergs, the rising levels of the seas. Uh, and uh, in, this, in this case, maybe we need a different kind of heroism. But Spiritually speaking, uh, situating yourself in life on a heroic, uh, uh, you know, uh, position might be necessary today, even though, as I said, perhaps a different kind of heroism. The heroism of being modest, the heroism of being, uh, but not uh, mediocre, modest. Maybe to have more, uh, I don't know, uh, more subtle interests, maybe to build less and certainly with less concrete uh, to uh, maybe is a time of uh, abstaining from building and uh, to reflect more, to contemplate more, 
to return maybe to the spiritual side of life, which we kind of neglected and assaulted the earth with, with too many constructions. This kind of optimism, vigorous optimism, which was actually um, a reaction to the madness of war, of the Second World War, we cannot easily have these days, although we are confronted with a war right now and not far away from where we are. But the expansion of humankind on, on water, although the next uh, Osaka World Exhibition in 2025 will do just that on an artificial island, will uh, create space for, uh, for the exhibition. Too bad, though, that um, like in the case of most exhibitions, world exhibitions, the buildings are destroyed uh, after a short while. And, uh, and, and this is certainly not sustainable. At the time when Ken, Kenzo Tange made his proposals, um, uh, the, the people didn't think in, 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 you know, in, in sustainable terms as we are forced these days. So it was a different time. But I appreciate very much the, 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 you know, the desire of the Japanese to show uh, you know, uh, proposals for, uh, uh, you know, um, it's not really about uh, you know, defeating nature, it's about uh, creating uh, interesting conditions of life, feasible conditions of life, um, but, but such belief in the human being today is, is, is less, less sustainable. And this kind of uh, visionary urbanism is also uh, uh, with difficulties sustainable. But this doesn't mean that we should stop dreaming, no. No. And here he is contemplating uh, his own scheme. Uh, as an urbanist. A dreamer and a, dro uh, and, and a doer. And the best uh, dreamers are those who are also doers. And the best doers are, the be are those who, are, who also dream. You have, to, you have to be both. Dreamer and doer. Doer and dreamer. Kenzo Tangier. And this is the last image of the presentation. Tangier did not imagine himself as a leading form giver. He sees himself in a state of transition. The role of tradition is that of a catalyst, which furthers a chemical reaction, but is no longer detectable in the end result. That's what he thought. He also contributed in the metabolism movement. Many metabolists had studied under Kenzo Tangier at Tokyo University's Tange Laboratory. Thank you.